All right. Welcome to episode 101 of Seize the Moment podcast. And today we have a very special guest. We have Brad Johnson. He's a former American football quarterback. During his 15-year career in the National Football League, Johnson played for the Minnesota Vikings, Washington Redskins, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and Dallas Cowboys. In the 2002 season, he led the Buccaneers to their first ever Super Bowl championship and earned his second Pro Bowl appearance. I want to make a big welcome to Brad Johnson. Yeah, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate you guys reaching out and let me be on your show. Thank you. Absolutely, man. And so for, you know, the fans out there and for those of people who pretty much who've known me, God knows since when, I've been a Bucks fan since God knows when, right? Yeah. So, and I'm obviously, Brad, I followed your career for many years, man. And so the first question, I, you know, the first question I got to ask is going back to the beginning of the 2002 season. So mm -hmm. you guys are literally coming off a loss. It's uh, after the 2001 season. 31 to nine, you guys lose to Philly again for the second year in a row. Tony Dungy, obviously one of the greatest coaches of all time, not just in Tampa, but in NFL history is gone. What was that like for you guys, especially when Gruden was brought in? Did you guys feel more or less hopeful after that season? Uh, the, <laughs> the Philadelphia Eagles had beaten Tampa Bay the year before I got there in the playoffs. Then when I got there, we lost the last game of the season, a non-game that didn't matter, but we played them the next week in a playoff game one nine, like you said, it was misery. Then, um, then they, we thought Tony Dungy was going to be there. They made a, a change. Uh, Tony went on Super Bowl with the Indianapolis Hall of Fame coach and career. Mm -hmm. So it, they bring in they bring in John Gruden and didn't know what to expect. I'd only seen him; they'd known him as Boy Wonder um, in Philadelphia as a as a play caller, and then in Oakland. You know, you just didn't know who he was. And so when he came there, though, there was a lot of excitement. Uh, the, the flags were raised. The expectations of winning a Super Bowl were there. In my first meeting, he said, Brad, we're going to win a Super Bowl. This was in February. And um, he says, you know, we're going to declare war on our defense. Warren Simeon Rice, Derek Brooks, Rondé Barber. Mm -hmm. Stop blast, stop the joker right X short 22X drive. Halfback burst. How are they going to stop trip right F right 358 in the brass X scene? He says, we're going to kill our defense and Monty Kiffin and all that they're about. He wanted to declare war, and it was, it was healthy, but he the competition, the team to be, we can win on offense, we can win on defense. And, and so he did make a bunch of moves in free agency with Ken Dilger and Ricky Dudley at tight ends and Joe Jerry Vicious and Kenny McCardell and uh, Robin Oban and Kerry Jenkins and Michael Pittman, the list goes on. So we upgraded in a lot of different areas. And they challenged us. Training camp was hard. Calling a play in the huddle was hard. Um, our team got tough. Our team started believing. We went three and one in every four games, ended up going 12 and four. And then it came true. We were ready for the moment when it happened uh, when we faced his old team in Oakland <laughs> to win mm -hmm. a Super Bowl. So, John, he, he made an instant impact on our team, the team in town, and uh, we came through when we had to. Yeah. And then it's like, man, going even into that season, I remember you guys lost to the Eagles. I think it was week uh, five or six, something like that. Yeah, it was October 20th yeah. of that year. They beat us, uh, I think 20 to, I think 20 to 10 was a score, but it felt like it was 45 to zero. Mm -hmm. and, um, I got my ribs cracked in that game, got sacked six or seven times. Damn. Um, was knocked out for the next couple of weeks, but we knew if we beat them, the road to the Super Bowl was going to go through the Philadelphia Eagles. So basically, we earned the right to get back to the playoff, um, got the right to go play them at in the NFC Championship game in Philadelphia, the last game at the vet in the. Um, and I remember Gruden said, "Listen, the night before, this game is going to be ugly. Something bad is going to happen to us early, but don't panic. Just don't panic. We we will win." And basically, they ran the opening kickoff back to our 25 yard line. Then Deuce Staley ran a touchdown. It was seven nothing. It was looking. It was you know below trees. They had all the white towels ready, <laughs> going crazy. And so it did happen. But he prepared us for the moment that you know our team was good enough. And then we, we made a lot of clutch plays during that during that course of the game to to close down the bet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so even going back to the beginning, I know a lot of people might not know this about John. And so maybe you too, Alan. So for our fans, so John Gruden's verbiage for like his offense is insanely complex, right? And so it's like he will give you a play that literally is just a basic running play and mm -hmm. he will give you like a million words for it, right? So you won't be like completely lost. So Brad, what was that like for you in that 0-2 season, actually trying to get the terminology and the language down? It was tough. It was tough. Yeah. I mean, he'd, he'd call U shift, the green left, west, F, shorts, power two, U, bananas, Z, overheads up for three. Smoke check H2 Miami. 
I mean, so you got a lot of things going there. You know, you got bunch right, bunch right tight, 72 scat Z jerk, heads up for 98 bunch crunch or 200 jet smoke or, or 97 Wanda. So like you call the play on the hole, you know? Yeah. So football is football. It is all about concepts. It's about angles or blocks. And it's about a number counts of reading the box count that's in the box. So he's a great, was a great teacher of, of concepts, of understanding what the defense was trying to do to you and how you could attack it. Every play didn't need to be a home run play, but you wanted positive plays. And, and so I learned a lot of football from, from Coach Gruden. Had a great relationship with him, still do to this day. But, yeah, you might throw four touchdowns and then come Wednesday's practice the next week, you had a hard time calling the play in the huddle. So a lot of learning, a lot of studying, but it's concept football, and uh, I, I feel like it was perfect style for me. Well, was it a bit intimidating when they brought in Rob Johnson? I was used to quarterbacks my whole life of competition. That's playing at Florida State. I played with um, I played with two guys that went on to win the Heisman, Chris Winkie and, and Charlie Ward. And one other guy was uh, runner up to the Heisman was Casey Weldon. Two other guys, Dan and Peter Tom Willis, they went to the NFL. So I was used to competition. And the pros, I've been with many, many great quarterbacks. And so uh, Rob and I have a great relationship. And, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to start that year and just, you know, whatever, whatever competition there is, you have to embrace it. But you can't get caught up in the competition of others. You really have to focus on, you know, how am I going to make the call in the huddle? How am I going to make the read at the line of scrimmage? What throws am I going to make? How am I going to impact the, the offensive line? How am I going to impact the team? What are, you know, so those things can't get caught up into who you're going against, but more of how you're going to approach your position. How would you learn to think like that? Was that something you came to yourself or was it from the coach or from just playing from years of playing? Yeah, you know, it's really it's really pretty neat. Um, basketball player in in, the university, in North Carolina as a high school kid. Love, I love sports. Grew up, my dad ran summer camps and dodgeball. I was playing soccer wars. I mean, anything you can name it. I was, I was competing mm -hmm. two square, four square, whatever it was. So competition is part of my life, but when I was in college, I met this guy. His name was Alex Serranos. Mm -hmm. I actually got a picture for you. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> My guy. All right. That's awesome. Alex Serranos. So he actually ran the dorm uh, at our at our at our Florida State. We lived at Burt Reynolds Hall. And um, one day he, he saw me jumping. I used to jump rope and run miles. I'd go swim in the pool and you know, I'd play tennis. I'd run five miles. I was just but he saw me jumping rope one day and uh, by the pool outside. And he says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm training. He, he says, well, I think you're training to be a triathlete. I don't know if you're training to be a quarterback. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I don't know. You know what I mean? So took it to heart. He said, why don't you come work out with me a little bit? So we started doing medicine balls. We did a lot of sand metrics. This was kind mm -hmm. of before people were doing those things now. And then we got into reading books. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot about how to dial into the moment, mm. those kind of things. And, and for a quarterback, for a quarterback, how to breathing after a good play, after a bad play. And so Alex, he's actually a sports psychologist. Oh, dope. Mm. Wow. Had his, yeah. So he was, he had his, he had all that. And everybody thought he was just running the door. I found one of the best <laughs> guys you could ever find to train with. So, wow. so it's really cool. But the deal is, he, he asked me a great question one time. He says, why do you play the game? And, and so this was in college and I couldn't, you know, my answer was like, well, I want to be the starter. Well, I want to, uh, he said, well, I want to, I want to be win a national championship. Well, so then what? So then I want to make it to the pros. So then what, you know, mm -hmm. I, I want to win a Super Bowl. So what? Like, and so it took me a long time to figure out why, why I really enjoy playing the game. And so the reason was it, it Took me a while to figure out. It was I call it for two seconds? Two seconds. It's being able to call the play in the huddle. Mm. You know, it's, it's trip right F short seven two scat Y swing. Like I love calling the play, and then I also you know I love getting at the line of scrimmage and blue eighty eight hot hot <laughs> black three fifty eight smoke. And you get into those kind of things. Well, it takes two seconds, and then to take the snap and drop back and then to manipulate the linebacker and then throw the, throw the square in, it takes two seconds. And then when you score a touchdown, you, you give it high fives, you, 
you're you're hugging somebody that you really know, you don't know, but you are. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Your your team. You, you, so the, it's it's those two. It's the feeling is what I'm talking about. So you get a great. It's like why do you play? I want to win a championship. Well, what if you don't? What if you don't win a championship? Right. Well, I'm a great golfer. I, I want to be. I want to. I want to back to that swing. You know, what I, mean? I I would think that's why a golfer plays to for that feeling of what it feels like to hit, a, hit the ball like that. You know what I mean? To make a crucial. Those are all like moments. You know, so so that was the answer. So my buddy here, Alex, he trained me like that. You know, mm-hmm. you think of you think of Miyagi training. <laughs> <laughs> wax on, wax on. Karate kid. You know what I mean? So yeah. this was before our and the so late eighties and nineties, we, we trained together for, for 17 years. And so it was a one-on-one kind of personal relationship we had, but you know, how do you act after you throw a touchdown? How do you re- react after you throw an interception? How do you how do you deal with the moments? How do you how do you how can you repeat success? How can you deal with this play, this play? Not worry about the future, like no, dial into the moment. So that's that's kind of what my guy Alex did for me. Oh, that's so wow. awesome. And do you remember what kind of books you read? Yeah, um, I can't remember all of them, but we started out with like a lot of like tennis books, like um, and then like archery, like Zen and Zen and Zen and archery. archery. And then yeah, yeah. and then um, uh, Jonathan Livingston Seagull. Then there's a book called Flow, and then but it's a lot of just yeah. sports psychology mo- uh, books. It's, it's all about dialing into the moment and how to control your breathing, how to not get distracted by things. Are there distractions? Yes. But embrace those and be able to, to, to put them aside when it, when, it, when it matters. So that's kind of the things that, were, that, that we read about and go through those kind of things. But a lot of it was really being able to control your breathing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, 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 you know, you hear a lot of people talk about it, especially in golf or tennis or individual sports. But I don't know if you hear about it so much as a uh, – team sport sometimes wow and that's so awesome because literally our first episode of this podcast two years ago was on the flow states yeah 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 because to think about the past or future or what's going on in your life while you're playing the game i'm just relating it to you uh yeah uh you you can't fully concentrate on the game if you have this narrative going on in your head and then on top of that breathing techniques that probably are going to affect your uh how you manage your energy and your anxiety too and anxiety too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, Brad, do you remember some of the things you took away from flow? No, I, I very much like we're talking about. And I, yeah. I think understanding that there are going to be distractions. Racing, you know what I mean? But being able to like, you know, I remember like, like we're talking about breathing instead of like running out to the huddle, I would walk to the huddle. Mm-hmm. I knew I had mm-hmm. a heart rate above a, under a certain level. You, you see it in uh, you see it in the Winter Olympics. The the people the skiers right, ski right. and they have to ski and they have to shoot. And, well, they the, the the more the the more the heart rate goes up, they the kind of just miss just by a little bit, you know. So I knew if my heart rate gets over one thirty, now if you're running and you're scrambling and you run to the sidelines, automatically it goes up to one fifty five, one sixty two. You kind of get in those moments like that. Now if I'm training like that, that's one thing. But when you're playing, you got to keep it down and just to be able to control the huddle. Uh, to be able to control what's going on the sidelines, to know when you're playing and when you're not playing. A lot of guys have wasted energy on the sidelines, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. so those kind of things. But, you know, obviously in a, in a game of football, there's going to be – there's average about 65 plays a game. Mm-hmm. Four or five plays where you have to make a crew play, but you don't know which play they are. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so – and so the first play is just as important as the last play. And those I remember from, you know, reading the book Flow or whatever the books were, you know, but it's more about down in the moment and not being, you know, be, not only just being able to focus, but being able to build to be able to refocus was a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Plus a- any of the things anyway in those books, you have to sort of take from it uh, some sort of like an intuitive kind of understanding. I mean, in at the end of it, you want to be in the moment. You want to be free of any extra thought. You want to just be focusing in on the action, right? So you're obviously not going to like think about the things that they wrote down, you know, like, oh, you have to, you know, set a challenge that meets your skills. And then you go into like, you don't think about that stuff. And the actual moment, all you care about is that like zeroed in focus. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's pretty cool too. So sometimes like, 
if you have negative thoughts, they do add up, you know? So it's like, so you, you throw back, God, oh, holy smokes. Like you might've done everything right. You might've done everything right. You might've thrown the perfect ball. Mm -hmm. And then the receiver dropped the ball. Well, all I can control is me. All I can control right. is the snap, the, my eyes, make the read, make the throw, make the play, and then it's over. And then be able to do success. So, but also like something bad happens, embrace it, but think of your positives along the way. So in tennis, you might hit the ball and say, man, I did a great job of bending my knees, good job with my eyes. Maybe all through just one more count, I, I hit over the net and I'm hitting winners. So I think being positive is a big deal um, in everything that you, but especially in sports. Yeah, absolutely. Man. Yeah, that's the winner effect, right? Right, go for it. Yeah, right. So that's that's cool. Yeah, every time you do something right, I mean, as long as you acknowledge that what you're doing is, is correct, it kind of builds up uh, confidence, keeps you in a kind of positive frame of mind mm -hmm. and keeps you from being... Um, so reactive uh, in, in the sense of like, oh, damn it, you know, I should have done this, I should have done that. It keeps you in a, a good sort of mood. So this way your, your resources are, are more clear. You could focus on what you need to do, what's in front of you. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And, and what were you going to say? Well, so yeah, I was actually going to ask Brad. So do you feel like when you were playing, were you a perfectionist? Was it really difficult for you to get over mistakes? Got me. You got, are you there? I'm here. You hear me? Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. Wait, so yeah, there's something a little bit off on the connection. How is it for you on your end? I'm, I just lost you there. So. It was just for a second. Oh, he okay. can hear you now. All right. yeah. All right. Okay. So, yeah. So, so, Brad, so for you on your end, right? Do you feel like were you a perfectionist when you were playing? Was it really difficult for you to overcome making mistakes? Well, you know, like in. <laughs> it, it, it's tough. You know what I mean? Because you want to hit, you want to go 25 for 25. Yeah. You know, you want to hit the guy in stride. You want to hit him here, not here. Mm -hmm. Throwing behind, he might drop it. It might, you know, hit him here. Mm -hmm. He might catch it. A two-yard pass, he might go for 22 yards. So, yeah. yeah, you get caught. I think it takes little things that you want to become. Be great at the little things and let the big things happen. Mm -hmm. But sometimes realizing that you can't, you can only control so much. And, you know, a lineman may get beat on a block. You made the perfect read, but there's, there's going to be things that happen. So don't let... Don't let one th one bad thing make things worse. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of things that happen, but yeah, I, I want to be, I want to be, I want to try to be great every day. I want, I think for me, I think I want to be prepared every day. If I'm prepared, that's all I that that's that's number one. And be physically be physically rested, be ready for whatever, be ready for the meeting, be ready for the practice. Obviously, be ready for game. Um, but I think the more you, you you're good at something. You feel good about it. You feel more confident about what you're doing. But just because I had a good warm ups doesn't mean I'm going to have a good game. I mean, so <laughs> it does come about, you know, making critical plays at critical times and, and those kind of things. But also, I think not just being about me, I think as a quarterback, I think you want you want to build up those around you. You know, it's a team sport. I need the linemen playing their best. I mean, even if even if they miss the block, dude, it's OK, man. Get the next one. It's going to be OK, you know. The guy drops the ball. He can't, dude. We'll watch the film. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out tomorrow. Let's 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 dial back now. Let's, so I think being able to encourage others around you is a big deal, you know, especially for a quarterback. Get the greatness out of others. Yeah, wow, absolutely. And then so going back to that 02 season, right? So now we're talking about Philadelphia, right? So this is three losses in a row. You guys now lose twice in the playoffs and so once in the regular season. How did you pick yourselves back up after that? Because I remember there was that like a uh, pretty famous quote on NFL films, right? Where I don't remember who the lineman was, but he told he tells Derek Brooks, he says, Y'all got scored on. And Brooks is like, Yeah, we'll be back. We'll be back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now we were we were a team full of rock stars and full of confidence. There's no doubt about that. But everybody gets beat at some point you get beat you know what i mean so it's how you rebound from it but but for us to go through them that was that was our super bowl that was that was that was as big as anything overcoming you know what they had done to us in the past there was much much respect between both teams but they they got the uh, they reaped the, the rewards in the past but this was a different year and not letting you know just because something bad happened you know last couple of years that wasn't going to happen on that day and uh, but I, I just remember things got things got off to a slow start in that game. But I remember there was a critical play 
early in the game and, and everyone talks about Rondé Barber at the very end of the game, yeah. um, making the, we were up 20 to 10. There's about two and a half minutes to go and he makes the interception. And then we win, we win the game 27, 10. It was a, it's one of the biggest moments in Buccaneer history because that was the moment we're going to the Super Bowl. Yeah. But early in the game, we were, we were down and we ran a play. It was called a triple left 83 double smash X option. So basically this play is, we got two guys running two corner routes and two guys running two flat routes. And then Joe Giovicius was going to go over the middle. A lot of times we call it X, not X option, but X jerk because we're going to make the mic, the middle linebacker look like a jerk. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I almost checked out of the play. And it, to me, it was the most critical play of the whole season. Um, because if I checked the play, I was either checking the 359 sticky, which would have been a, a four yard stick route. I was either checking 98 bunch crunch was a toss, or I was checking the 59 Lexus, which was basically a curl flat. And I just said, stick with it. For some reason, I said, stick with it. I remember all the meetings. I remember, hey, if I make a bang R call, we're going to slide the line to the right. The guy's not going to, we can pick up the blitz and we can run this play. So basically, we make the call, stick to, stuck to the rules. And then actually, Joe Jervicious, he catches the ball in the middle. He runs it for a 73 yard run. Everybody knows it's go, Joe, go yeah. at that time. That's probably his most famous play, but I think it's the most critical play in Buccaneer history as far as winning the Super Bowl that year. Uh, was that, and it, for me, it was sticking to my rules of how I was trained by, you know, by Gruden, by making the, you know, the call and knowing my hots or knowing how to slide the protection and then letting guys make their play. So that was triple F 83 double smash X option. Legendary. And it's like, and I think a lot of people don't know that Joe Gervicious actually didn't even, almost didn't play that game. For real? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. He was actually almost out because yeah, his baby at the time was in the hospital. So like, very, so his child was, he ended up being born premature. And so obviously they weren't sure Joe was going to make it. And then another famous quote, you know, Sap comes up to Joe and he says, uh, Joe, everything good. And he says, no, but I'm good. <laughs> yeah. 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 His baby, his baby passed away. Yeah. And, uh, so, um, but so Joe, we didn't know if he was going to play in that game, and uh, so it was. It was uh, he shows up late Saturday, uh, Saturday. I think it was Saturday. Yeah, Saturday night. He shows up late to the hotel. We didn't know if he was going to play at the hotel. Even when he was at the hotel, we didn't know. <laughs> so we see him Sunday, and Joe's ready. And then you know, and so it, it all happened. And so Joe and I, we've actually we we stayed great friends. He's got. I has a couple, a couple of daughters, one that just got a scholarship to a Nebraska as a volleyball player. She's a top player in the country. Hopefully she makes the Olympics one day. And mm -hmm. uh, so it's pretty cool. But Joe, Joe was a tough guy. He actually played in three Super Bowls, yep. one with New York Giants, one with us, and then one with Seattle Seahawks uh, when they played, um, I think, uh, D who did they play? Pittsburgh, I think. So he played in three. It's pretty, pretty awesome. Yeah. Would you say that he was one of, one of the most underrated players that you've played with? Yeah, Joe, Joe was he, he's six foot four, two twenty five, two twenty something like that. Tough, physical guy. Uh, played at Penn State. Mm -hmm. um, he just he just kind of would make. He was really pretty much the third receiver for us, but he could be a starter. But he's really the third, so he's kind of underrated with us. He had a, we had Kenny McCardell and Keyshawn Johnson, so he's kind of the guy that wasn't talked about. But in critical moments, he's the one you, you kind of want to go to a lot of times. So. But Joe, was, he's a winner. Obviously, his career, what he did, and uh, just kind of what his toughness they brought to the team. Yeah, wow. And now, so kind of, all right, so we're done now with the Eagles game, right? You guys obviously leave. And, oh, by the way, Veterans Stadium, that was the last game at Veterans Stadium. So wow. the Bucks literally shut Veterans Stadium down. It was done after that, right? Mm -hmm. So you they just shut it down. Then the next year, we actually played them in the vet. I mean, in yeah. the Lincoln, Lincoln Memorial, I think that's what it's yeah. called. So yeah, they closed it down and opened it up. Opened too. it up, opened it up. Yeah, so the Bucks the next year literally beat them 17 nothing. And speaking of Joe Gervicious, he had probably one of the greatest catches of all time, week one in 2003. What was that like for you, like, to actually see that? I was like, holy shit. Yeah, he had he had two touchdowns in that game. He caught yeah. one back in the end zone. Uh, the play was called Week Right Rest, 72 shape uh, wide drive. I just threw it almost, I threw it out of bounds, and he kind of toe-tapped it. And then the other one was a play called uh, Double Right, Sprint Right, Q8. And basically, it was a rollout to the right. They were in a full-out blitz. And I roll out. We're about on the six or seven-yard line. And I actually threw it behind him. Yep. And, yeah, almost – if the guy would have picked it off, he would have ran it 
99 yards for a touchdown. But Joe, I think he played volleyball at Penn State. But he um, – for at least a year or two. But the ball was behind him. He actually tipped it like this yep. and then caught it like this. Yep. It was it was a special play. <laughs> but for Joe, he's like, ah, it's just kind of what he did. He didn't think much about it. And didn't take much credit for it. That's just kind of what he did. But Joe, was, he, was, he was tough and, and had those kind of unique skills. Yeah. Yeah, and just to kind of go back to our audience for a little bit, right? The banner behind you, Super Bowl 37, right? So now literally you guys beat Philadelphia. We're in Super Bowl 37. The coolest thing about this, and so again, going back to our audience and even for you too. So Gruden literally gets traded from the Raiders, right? So they trade Gruden for a bunch of draft picks, a bunch of first rounders, second rounders, right? Mm -hmm. Now Gruden is in the Super Bowl playing his old team, right? Everybody, old coaches, old like teammates, pretty much everybody he knew for years at that point, mm -hmm. right? You guys are at Super Bowl 37. It would literally seems like a Hollywood story where you have this guy coming back to get revenge on Al Davis and the rest of them, right? These like really asshole pirates. So what was that like for you guys preparing for that? You know, that week, usually there's two weeks in between the Super Bowl. Yeah. And that week there was just one. And uh, so when we left on that, um, we played Philadelphia on that Sunday, Monday, the team traveled. They stayed, the coaches stayed back on Monday. They actually uh, ran Mark Cuban's plane. They came out Tuesday night. And then we started our practice Wednesday, but Gruden, he's, he's always organized, always a film watcher, you know, 3.34 in the morning and yep. bags under his eyes watching so much film and stuff, but, but he was ready. And, and so obviously he knew their personnel because of the, the guys that they had, he'd been coaching before, but I think he, we were just ready to play. We, we had a bunch of guys, we were fresh. And um, I actually think the one week helped us out because we just came out we were ready to play. Um, didn't get distracted by, you know, getting tickets and hotels and airplane tickets for everybody. We just, let's just play the game and get it over with and go. But, but Gruden, he was, he was dialed in for the moment, you know, and, um, so it's pretty, it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah. And what was it like for you in the first quarter? Cause first quarter, obviously one of the first plays you throw a pick to Charles Woodson, was that discouraging? Yeah. You, you know, I, I, I tell you going to the Super Bowl, it, it's, it's kind of unique. Okay. So, you know, all your life, all my life, I've sat in there. I've been at parties and eating chips and dip and watching for this game. You know what I mean? So I come out for warm ups and you get you get there real early. You don't get there. You have to get there like three and a half hours before the game takes place. And so we go through warm ups and you're hanging out forever. And then I remember the the national anthem. The, the Dixie Chicks were singing the national anthem and Celine Dion was singing "God Bless America." Then I'm watching Bob Greasy and Don Shula and. Larry Zonka, they're out there doing the coin flip. And, and so it's just it's just more than people know. And the game was slow in the first quarter. I mean, neither team could do anything. I think they it was just it was just a slow first quarter. I think I was started out the game at four, I was four for 13, but and I had a pick early in the game. But kind of like we were talking about earlier, on the pick, I actually dropped back. The play was called uh trips right, zebra left, 58 delta, zebra choice. And basically it was a stutter go by Keenan McCardell. I looked the safety off. Keen McCardell, he goes by Charles Woodson. It's going to be about a 25, 30 yard hit. Well, I get hit in the left, the ball goes fluttering up, and it's a pick. And I'm like, I, I didn't do anything. I didn't feel bad, but, but when you're a quarterback, it's like, it's like running through, you know, a pat on the back and slapping the face at six inches away. You find out who your friends are. When you throw a touchdown, they're giving you all high fives. When you throw an interception, like, what'd you do wrong, man? I, I didn't do anything wrong. But I threw four or five balls away, had the pick. It was just a slow first quarter, but, you know, it, we kind of got hot in the second quarter, then kind of ran off with it. But those are, you know, we weren't, I mean, the game never got out of tack in the first quarter. Yeah, man, absolutely. And then so even just thinking about like as the game progressed, um, what do you think it was when sort of, mm, let me see what I wanted to ask. So, damn, now I lost the question. So it was about something about the defense. Uh, Wow. Oh, my God. Actually, we had, we had a couple oh, interceptions Lord. in the second quarter, and mm -hmm. uh, Dexter Jackson had a couple interceptions. Yes, that's what I wanted to ask. Yeah, so that was the big <laughs> question, right? Were yeah. you guys surprised? Um, well, this is a little bit of a defensive question, but were you guys surprised that literally Callahan didn't change the offensive playbook at all? So going back into, like, your practices, obviously. So Gruden literally was even throwing the ball in practice, right? So he was right. literally practicing being Rich Gannon. And so uh, these plays that they were calling in practice as the Raiders, the Raiders were still calling because they were using the same playbook. So there was this really mm -hmm. great uh, this really great uh, film scene where literally John Lynch is like, yo, Monty, I'm calling it. It's Slug O'Seam. That's, that's going to be the play. 
literally they got it right so that was the play dexter jackson gets the first pick so did that surprise you guys that they didn't really disguise much in that playbook i, I think lynch was saying sluggo seen every play it was oh was he <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's that's the truth, man. That's a lot of gets talked about. Kind of what you're saying that we Gruden knew their defense. You know, what I mean, knew their offensive playbook. But mm -hmm. the thing about it, they knew our offensive playbook too, because they had him as their coach for four yeah. years. So right. it's really, it really gets spun around the wrong way. It's, both teams knew each other. Both teams were great. Uh, Rich Gannon was the MVP of the season that year yeah. uh, for the Oakland Raiders, and had a great team. Uh, at the end of the, at the end of the half, we went up twenty to three. We mm -hmm. ran a one touchdown was Michael Allstott. Uh, he ran a green right close fourteen blast, and then uh, we threw a uh, fade stop to Keenan McCardell at the end of the half. Uh, the play was called South Right Nickel Forty One Kill Three Seventy Four Wasp, and it was one on one with Keenan McCardell. He was great at back shoulder fades, and so we went up twenty to three at half, and so we felt like we had a little you know belief that we could you know pull it out in the second half. Yeah, the second house had the second half was literally a slaughter fest. I mean, the, I, so the one of the best stories of that season again talking about like these Hollywood kind of scripts and these endings. So Gruden literally challenges the defense in the beginning of the season. He says, "You guys are so great. Score nine touchdowns on defense, right?" And defenses like really aren't known for touchdowns. Mm -hmm. So he's like, "If you guys are so good, set us up in positions to win the game. Score nine touchdowns on defense." So literally in that Super Bowl, they scored eight, no seven, eight, and nine touchdowns. Yeah. Wow. Uh huh. So we had two by Dwight Smith and one by Derek Brooks. How crazy was that, that it kind of ended up so picturesque? It did. They, well, one time we were up 34 to three in the third mm -hmm. quarter. You think the game was over. And then all of a sudden they threw a, uh, they threw a touchdown pass to Jerry Porter, 34, nine, they went for two. Yep. Then they block a punt. They went for two. Now the score is 34, 15. Then they throw a touchdown pass to Jerry Rice, 34, 21. Like there's seven and a half minutes to go in the game. Like, what are we doing here? The game, so the momentum kind of changed late in the uh, late in third quarter, early four. The game kind of the momentum changed, but defense. And then we had uh, two interceptions at the very end of the game with like a minute to go with Derrick Brooks and then Dwight Smith intercepted, and the game. You know, then the game was over. Yeah, that's so crazy, man. So, and what was that like for you? I was sure the euphoria was intense, like winning, actually winning the Super Bowl finally, especially for the Bucks, twenty-seven years, twenty-seven year wait. Yeah, and then let me show you two things. So all my life, everybody said I was always too slow, you know? Yeah. And so one of those kind of things, and, and when I met Gruden, I told you about that original meeting, we're going to win the Super Bowl meeting. Yeah. He said, Brad, are you going to make some plays with your feet this year? You know, you can make some plays with your feet. And so I said, yeah, coach. You know, I wasn't known for <laughs> being a runner or, you know, run around kind of guy. But the night before the Super Bowl, Brad, he said, Brad, are you going to make a play with your feet? I need a play. You make a first down. So – Oh, it's, yeah, sure. No okay, hold on a second. <laughs> Man, I love the banner. Sorry about that, guys. It's okay. Man. No, it's all good. Got me. So, so basically, and so in that third quarter, we we had an 89-yard drive for a touchdown. Yeah. And and so the play was um, triple left, F short, 70, 72 crisscross wide swing, and third and nine, and no one was open. I ended up making a scramble. Okay. So all that time with my friend Alex Serranos, yep. mm -hmm. talked about earlier in the picture here. Yep. He always said, Brad, you're you're a good enough athlete. You're fast enough. You can make plays with your mm -hmm. feet. You're better athlete than people know. I actually played two years of basketball. Mm -hmm. So this was a run here that I had. I don't know if people can see. Oh, it. I love that. Yep. So wow. you don't really get to control uh, what the media says. You know, so everybody remembers the John Elway moment. Yep when he did the helicopter deal. Well, yep. this was my mom. I love it. Okay. Yeah. Yep. For nine yards and nobody remembers it. <laughs> but, but all my life I've worked for that moment. Yep. You know, it got the first down, it drove us down, got a touchdown and, and then, then we march and then it, it happens, you know? So my moment was in that game. And so mm -hmm. when the game was over, I got to take you back to 1987 when I was a mm -hmm. senior in high school, because I didn't know if I was going to play football or basketball in college. I was a North Carolina 3A player of the year out of high school, scored 2,392 points. And I wanted to go to either University of North Carolina play for Dean Smith or Bobby Crimmins at Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. So I ended up making a decision that year. Um, everyone thought I was similar to a guy named Vinny Testaverde. That was one of the bigger quarterbacks coming out. 
he wore the jersey number 14, which I wear. And so that was who I wanted to emulate at that time. He won the Heisman National Championship, I believe, and those kind of things. And so that year of 1987, the great Phil Sims, when I'm trying to make a decision, football or basketball, um, Phil Sims, they win the Super Bowl with the New York Giants, and he throws three touchdowns against Denver Broncos, and John Elway goes 22 for 25. And after the game, he said he's going to Disney. You yeah. know, that was the first year for Disney. And so 16 years later, I, we win the game, 48-21, uh, confetti's falling. Uh, I'm with my wife. She's seven and a half months pregnant with our other son, Jake. I get to hold Max. I'm with Gruden. And so here's the picture of that. I love that. Wow. Confetti's falling. Pretty awesome. So I didn't know if I was going to play football or basketball in 1987. 16 yep. years later, I get to say I'm going to Disney. <laughs> and, and relive that moment of kind of the reasons why I thought I might be a professional football player and maybe not a professional basketball player because of certain talents and stuff. So it's an incredible moment to say for one minute, for one moment, that you're the best quarterback on the best team in the world yeah. and to have done it one time, say you has been and never was. But, but that's not the reason why you play. It goes back to the two seconds because I'm still the same guy if we had never had won the game. Yep. That that would never change, but it does give you a platform because of winning and what we did accomplish that year. Yeah, actually, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, and, and you, I, I, like, it doesn't. I think it doesn't even necessarily matter what the country on the whole thinks, because, like, I mean, as I'm sure you know, to Buccaneer fans and just in Tampa in general, you will always be a legend. I'm pretty sure they're going to induct you into Ring of Honor at some point in the next couple of years. Yeah, I, I don't know, but but I, I I know that for a quarterback what you want is the ball in your hands. Yeah. You want the opportunity to lead a team. And you need rock stars with you. And if you're going to win a, a Super Bowl, you need a bunch of guys that are pro bowlers. And eventually you need guys that are Hall of Famers. And we have Derek Brooks and Rondé Barber. I mean, Derek Brooks and Warren Sapp and John Lynch that's going in this year. And then hopefully we get Rondé Barber and Simeon Rice. But and Simeon, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The Simeon thing I don't even understand. Simeon should have been a first ballot Hall of Famer easily. This guy is literally on the top of the sack list. and one of the greatest edge rushers ever. Hmm. Yeah. And, and, and so for things like that, whether it's whatever it is, and so I learned not to get caught up into what's called a vote. Yeah. Are you a Pro Bowl player? Well, they didn't vote me. No. I, <laughs> you, right. you can't worry about the vote. You got to worry about your team. And then those kind of things come with it. So that was the thing. It was just, it was an awesome group of guys. And, you know, a lot of awards have come after because of what we did accomplish. And um, so it's pretty neat to say I was, you know, part of that team and to be able to lead that team. Absolutely. What do you want to ask, Alan? Oh, yeah. So going back to basketball, I noticed uh, on social media, on TikTok, I, I noticed there's some videos where I see you throwing the football into the basketball hoop. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, that looks so cool. Yeah. Leon was showing that to me, uh, like just just before. Yeah, yeah. I was like, "How does he do it?" And you did it like one after the other. It's cool. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah it's Big Bad Brad fourteen on TikTok, and I kind of when I my kids kind of got on it when the pandemic ha happened a year ago, and I was like, "What is that?" And so oh, I kind of started getting into it a little bit, and then I made a lot of videos of my career and just different funny things too on there now. But mm -hmm. it's kind of you can start kind of if you follow it from from the first one on to what it is now, but now I'm into trick shots and, you know, I'm throwing, you know, goals and poles and whether it's footballs or basketballs, and I try to do everything in multiple shots, not just one trick shot and then splice them together. And it's gotta be two, three, four, five shots in a row. If I don't get that last shot, then I don't, I don't do it. I, I would not post it. I don't feel comfortable doing it because I want to make it something hard, something different than somebody else has done. But, I'm either out there on the basketball court, spinning the ball off a finger or bouncing off the ground or over the backboard or throwing footballs in the, into the goal. So I, I have a lot of fun doing that kind of stuff. And is that like part of the way you get your, uh, the two seconds in, uh, like one yeah. of the things that you do? Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm not, I can't, I, I can't play any more games, you know, <laughs> yeah. my body's over, my, my body's done. But when that ball goes in the hole, like making these shots, it's not just one shot that I'll make. It may be, two, three shots, and sometimes they go fast. But then sometimes, I mean, hell, I may be out there for three hours. I mean, it's work. Like, it's work. And then if I don't get it, then I'll come back the next day. So it's not as easy as just it looks. Oh, there it goes, there it goes, there it goes. Like, it's it's work. But when it goes in, I'm like, yeah! You know what I mean? And that's the, it's the feeling that you want. And then, you know, I may run to Zaxby's and drink a big thing of sweet tea and 
kind of enjoy, man, did you see that? So it's not really about if, how many views it gets or how many, it's just that feeling for me to make that last shot. And I do get excited about it. Yeah, absolutely. And also kind of going back to the Bucks again. So now you guys win the Super Bowl and now 2003, you guys, minus I think Dexter Jackson and I think uh, Jeff Christie was gone too, right? So, but you guys have virtually the same team, really great team, right? So week one, you knock out Philadelphia 17 to zero, right? And so what happened? What do you think happened with you guys? And how come sort of, the, I mean, the expectations were obviously high, right? And yeah. how come, yeah, I mean, how come no playoff from that year? Yeah. What do you think, what do you think contributed to that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it didn't happen. Number one didn't happen, but that year we we were we 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 came in grooved. We were ready to like make a run at it. First game we went seventeen nothing yep. over Philadelphia on Monday Night Football. The next week, it's we score with no time left on the clock against Carolina, nine to nine. All we need is an extra point. The game's over. It gets the game's over. Extra point. It gets blocked. We lose in overtime. We win the next week. Then we have a 35-14 game. I don't know if you remember against the Colts on Monday night. Oh, my God. I actually cried that game, man. I literally – I remember being a kid and crying. I'm like, what the hell happened? Yeah. So we lose that game. Like, how do you lose that game? You know? Yeah, that was a tough one. It happened. And yeah. then we lose another game. We have another lead against – we had a lead, another lead against – so we, we lost these crazy games. Yeah. And But at the same time, we lost, we lost a lot of injured players that year. Joe Jerry Vicious was out. Mike Allstott was out. Um, we lost um, Shelton Corals, our middle linebacker. Was, we lost seven players to injury that season. They were gone. So just things, it just tumbled on us. From injuries to losing some crazy games, it just didn't happen. And then the next year, they got – everybody was gone. I mean, yeah. Cap was gone. Joe Jerry Vicious was gone. I mean, the whole – the team got dispersed and they had to pretty much start all over again, but we were ready to do it our second year, but injuries and some crazy games, you know, cost us that year. I mean, if you feel comfortable speaking on it, why do you think they let Sapp and Lynch go the following year? I don't know. I mean, I, I wasn't, I mean, there's, this it happens to, you know, it's like, why did, why did Joe Montana get traded when he was with San Francisco? Why did Jay right. Wright, why, how come he didn't finish as a 49er? Like, those kind of things just happen, whether it's contracts, whether it's looking for younger players, it happens to just about everybody in the NFL. Yeah. I mean, did it kind of suck for you in 2004 after obviously, I mean, that, that was kind of your last season with the Bucks. Then you get benched for first Chris Sims, then Brian Greasy, and now you're going to play for Minnesota. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the way the last year, it just, it was a weird year. You know what I mean? I was going through some injuries at that time. The team was, a, we were just, we weren't a very good team. <laughs> to say the least, but we didn't, we just didn't get it done. And then it was time to move on for me too. So I went to Minnesota team uh, uh, that I've been with before the coach. I knew him, Mike Tice, a system that I knew. So I was very comfortable at that time. I think I was 37, 38. Yep. And I was kind of ready to finish out my career in a place I'd already been and, and felt good about that situation. Yeah. And what was so cool about that, by the way, so at that age, right? So Brad literally goes to Minnesota. He's the backup quarterback. So Dante Culpepper, who was literally their like all-star franchise quarterback, he's gone at this point. Right. And everybody's like, oh my God, Brad Johnson's not going to be the starting quarterback. Like there's no way these guys are going to win games. Mm -hmm. You were on fire, man. Like how the hell did that happen? That was an incredible run at that age. Yeah. At the, Dante Culpepper got hurt in the Carolina game. At that time we were two and five. I yep. ended up starting after that and was one of the probably one of the most highlights of my career. I ended up winning six in a row. Season, yep. we ended up going nine and seven. I had a, a chance to get in the playoffs, but, but I really got a chance to lead the team, kind of impact them with the plays I liked, the audibles. Uh, had a lot of power or, or more say-so with that team than any other team I'd probably ever had had. Uh, so I, I enjoyed going back to that opportunity. I hated it for Dante. And injuries were part of the game. and But uh, it was a great, great opportunity for me to play again, especially back up in Minnesota. Yeah, and I remember thinking, like, wow, man, the Bucks really missed the, missed the kind of ball on this one, man. I don't know how they got rid of you before that. Yeah, it's crazy. The moves are made, you know what I mean? And that, yeah. that happens with all kinds of players. It's out, there's a lot of things that are out of your control. But, but I was just thankful for another opportunity. And I knew I could play. I knew I could win. And so that was, that was, that was just grateful for that opportunity. Absolutely. And so just going back to kind of mindsets, right, and especially resilience, something that we constantly talk about on this show, what were some of your toughest moments in football and how did you find a way to overcome them? Yeah, I, I mean, so I, I, my career starting really with Florida State, it wasn't it wasn't the greatest 
really for a college player. I only started six, maybe seven games. I got benched in college. Um, I thought about quitting, thought about transferring. I thought about um, going back and just playing basketball. And then I said, why did I go to Florida State? I, I went there to be a part of a great, great program. Stay there. I'm going to read you something. Okay, okay cool. Okay, go for it. All yeah, right. I ain't leaving you. I ain't leaving you. Stay with me. I'm going to read something. <laughs> I'll read you I don't know if your fans can see this, but I, I'm in my. Okay, can y'all see my posters oh, in the back? I love oh, it. Oh, yeah. Man. Yep. <laughs> That's you awesome. See that guy, Larry Bird? Yep. Yeah. All right, I'll take you a little tour. Can you see my guy, Larry Bird, here? <laughs> oh, wow, man. You're wow. a huge fan. Yeah, I'm a huge fan. So, yeah. so, so when I got benched at Florida State, I got this friend named T.R. Robinson. Mm hmm. He just has a unique way of meeting people. So he met this guy named Larry Bird. I don't know how he did. <laughs> he wrote. I got this letter from Larry Bird, all right? What? Wow. I'm going to read it to you. I'm going to read it to you, okay? Go for it. Mm -hmm. All right, it says, Brad, just got off the phone with TR. TR was a good friend of mine. I knew him, childhood friend. Mm -hmm. He told me a little bit about life in no land. I thought I'd relate this story to you. Remember when I hurt my foot? All the skeptics came out, but I kept on believing. Then I came back. They said I was slower, wider, and uglier, but I kept believing. <laughs> it would have been easy to call it a career, but looking back on it, I'm glad I kept on believing. So Brad, a little advice. There are a lot of people out there who believe in you, so keep your head up, keep busting your tail, and always remember to keep on, believe, uh, to keep on believing. Wow. wow. That's so cool, man. Wow. Man, I mean, yeah. That's my hero. I've never met him. I've, I've watched <laughs> unbelievable games, but... You know, just you think a letter of encouragement from you know your hero, yeah. however it happened, and um, it's pretty awesome, you know. So I think I want to finish out my career. I said I want my my goal here was to, you know, lead the team here at Florida State. Obviously, it's not going to happen, but my dream hasn't been given up. Yeah. And so my dream is to play in the pros. So I was a ninth round pick, 227th pick in the NFL 1992 draft, the 14th quarterback that was uh, drafted that year. And, you know, I felt like I was the best quarterback of that draft, but I wasn't ready to play because I didn't have a lot of playing time. And so, you know, that was, that was an upsetting time. But, and then, you know, I think um, I went through a bunch of injuries. I had a neck injury. I had three knee surgeries, two toe surgeries, broken thumb, broken leg. I, I mean, I kind of went through all those kind of things. And so I, I think it was, you, you, you never leave your, your passion to play the game, you know? Why, and I go back to why do you play the game? So, you know, it goes back to the two seconds on everything. The feel of the ball, the call the play in the huddle, to the high fives, the look off the linebacker, to, to leading your team, you know? But, but one of the cool things about me, because I didn't play my first couple of years in the NFL and going through those experiences was my dad always said, it's better to be prepared and not have an opportunity than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. It's yeah. such a simple thing, but you know, you never know when your moment's coming. And so a lot of guys that are backing up, they're complaining, I'm better than that guy. And then they get that opportunity. And then the, the first snap, they fumble, you know, and they're not ready. They, they didn't, they were ready in training camp, but then game seven of the regular season, when they get their opportunity, they're like, they kind of fell asleep in the meetings, you know, mm -hmm. didn't quite, wasn't quite ready. So you gotta be ready. You gotta be lucky at the same time. I do believe in a little bit of that the ball has to bounce your way and something has to take place, but you got to be ready for when that time comes because you're going to have an opportunity at some point. So that was, that was key in my life. Yeah. And so what, for us, one of the most inspirational things that we've heard on the show is, so we had the wrestler diamond Dallas page on the January, which was a really fucking awesome show. And so DDP told us, he said, you know, never underestimate the power of somebody believing in you and going back to your story with Larry bird. Like that's it, man. That's like the prime example of something like that, where you have pretty much a kid, right. Who's literally still in college, obviously struggling, wondering, trying to figure out like, what is it that I'm going to do with the rest of my life? Is this a sport that's viable for me? And then you literally have the greatest basketball player of all time time telling yeah. him that yeah kid you should stick with it so so awesome man and just thinking about like the power that people have over other people right and i'm assuming this also goes into your time in the nfl especially obviously your time with the bucks like how did you guys pick each other up right how did you guys sort of inspire confidence in each other when you were in the nfl mm. yeah it, it's contagious yeah it's also it can be 
you can bring people down or you can lift people up. And it's all said, DDP like, said that too. I love that. Yep. Yeah, it's it's very true, you know. And so it's contagious. And so you want to be in the boat with a bunch of winners, man. And you got to yeah. encourage that. But it, but you have to embrace the losses because teams don't really go undefeated. You know what I mean? You have to embrace when someone gets hurt, next man up. You have to embrace every, we're not going to score on every drive. We may have to punt, but if you just stick, if you just, and our, and our, and our slogan that year was pound the rock. Yeah. I mean, just whatever it is, good, bad, and different. Just keep, just keep, just keep pounding the rock. And eventually we're going to break that rock and we're going to break through, but though you, you have to have it, you know what I mean? And so when you do get that opportunity in the very end, you gotta be able to breathe. Yeah. You know, you can't think, you can't think the moment's too big. You just gotta think, do your job. Just, just do the fundamentals, stick to the fundamentals that you've been taught in training camp and mini camp and practice every day and the meetings and all that stuff is worthwhile. And, you know, the, the, the thought of, you know, the, the juice is worth the squeeze. It, it's, it's definitely true. You know what I mean? So you're going to have to go through some, you're going to have to go through hardship. You are at some point and, uh, but embrace it. Wow. And so going back to Larry Bird, who were some of your other kind of like idols in the sports world? Yeah, I'll tell you something really, really cool. Um, another guy that I really liked was a guy named Chris Mullen. Mm-hmm. And so I grew up basketball player in North Carolina, and he played for St. John, St. John's, and ended up uh, playing for the Golden State Warriors, Indiana Pacers, won two gold medals. 1984 and then 1992 for the dream team. And then, so I have a good friend that his name is Mark Fox. He used to be the head coach here at Georgia basketball. Now he's the head coach at university of California. And uh, he's like, Brad, you're not going to believe this. Who's who lives right down the road from me. He said, who? He said, Mully, Mully, Chris Mullen. Yeah. Chris Mm -hmm. Mullen. So this past year I got to play golf, spent three days with Chris Mullen, (laughs) play golf with him ended up becoming really good friends. So he, he was one of my heroes also. Mm-hmm. Wow, so awesome, man! And then, so just curious, what how did what did you think about the Bucks this year? Yeah, it was pretty awesome. I mean, yeah, Super Bowl in two thousand three. Bucks have not made the playoffs, or uh, not won a playoff game in eighteen years. Yeah. So, I thought the last couple of years, I was with Todd Bowles, the defense coordinator uh, for Tampa. Now I was with him in Dallas. Yep. He was the head coach for the Jets at some point, and then. But just a, a great, great coach. I think their defense has been phenomenal the last couple of years. And then they just think a lot of credit. Um, Tampa struggled offensively, turned the ball over and those kind of things. So a move was made. Brady came in there. He's a guy who's, you know, been to 10 Super Bowls, won seven, lost in four AFC championship games, one of the most games ever and as a quarterback. And, I mean, it's all, it's all been documented. So when they did, they made the moves. It was very similar to our year. They brought in a bunch of free agents. They had a tremendous defense. They're top five defense. They scored 145 points off of defensive turnovers. They scored 45 points off of turnovers in the playoffs. Um, they won three games on the road at Washington, New Orleans, and then at Green Bay. Then they won the home game at Tampa. So what they accomplished this year was, was awesome in the pandemic year. Being in the first year like we did under Gruden system, first year for Tom Brady being under uh, Bruce Arians system. So – a lot of similarities, to be honest with you. Yeah, and a lot of people compare Brady to Gruden. They're like, it's literally the same story. Brady comes in, he's like, yeah, guys, we're winning the Super Bowl. Exactly what Gruden told you guys. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it takes a little bit of swagger. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, 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 but their, their team was built to win it. Yeah. You know, Some teams aren't built to win it. So maybe you can't say those kind of things. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I hate to say that, but, that if, but when you team, there are certain teams that are built to win it and, Tampa this year, with especially with the moves they made in free agency, all the players that they brought in on the offensive side, the defense that they had, they were built to win it. And I think it was one of those the expectations were there from 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 get go. Yeah, man, and thank God Vita Vea came back because that was like a huge blow. I think it was Week Five against the Bears. Vea, who's literally our best defensive player, goes down, and we're like, "Oh shit, man!" And then he literally so one of the best stories from the season where literally Bruce Arians tells him, he said, "Look, man, he's like, you worry on getting healthy, we're worrying about getting into the playoffs." And then literally Vita Vea comes back for I think it was the divisional game against Green Bay. Yeah, no doubt, and that's where I mean, players are going to get. I mean, in football, it's like you know, in a rodeo. It's not a matter of if you get hurt, it's a matter of just when. It's going to happen. Injuries happen. 
That's why you have a 53-man roster. Uh, backups are going to have to play. Guys got to play through tough times and then uh, through injuries, and then they came back, and then they were ready to, to get hot when, when they had to. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, I mean, this is, might sound like a stupid question, but I still want to ask anyway before we wrap up. Brad, if you had to pinpoint one favorite moment, what would that be as a football player? Wow. Um, I mean, one of the coolest plays was obviously, was obviously I threw a touchdown pass to myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. That was dope. Yeah. yeah. So basically the play was, but that's not the play I'm going to talk about. I'll talk about it real, real quick though. Uh -huh. That play was called dot left spear, rip Dallas is basically stick flat. I threw it, mm. forward pass, the ball got deflected, scrambled, ran for a touchdown. It's 12 points in fantasy football. Uh, <laughs> it had never been done before and I uh, won an SP award. And But I think the coolest play for me was my very first touchdown pass, um, 1996. Warren Moon was the starting quarterback. He got hurt in the first game of the uh, of the season against the Detroit Lions. The week before in preseason, I had a bad preseason game. I thought I was going to get cut. And uh, my dad, he surprised me that game. He surprised me. He showed up. At, I saw him at the bus after the game. I'm like, I'm almost in tears. I'm going to get cut. We lose the last preseason game, which nobody remembers. But, you know, it was one of those deals. Well, the very next week, he'd been through a heart surgery that, that – that spring and summer, I you know, didn't know if he's gonna make it. And then so that very first game, Warren Moon gets hurt. I come in the game, we come from behind, I throw a, a touchdown pass uh, to Chris Carter to win the game. This play was called change right, base right, 086 F flat. I found him on a post with my first touchdown pass. So that was a, probably one of the coolest moments. And then after the game, I threw my ball up to my dad in the stands. And so it was, that's kind of the beginning of my career, but that was probably the coolest moment to be honest with you. Wow. Sounds so awesome. And so what do you think are the Bucks' chances this year? Wow, man, they're loaded. They're loaded. Yeah. They, brought, they brought the team back, but it's kind of like we talked about before. It's, I mean, it's it's 16 games. You have injuries. You have crazy games. You got to go earn yeah. it. But they got the team to make up to, to be a, a great team. But it's like last year they were 7-5 and five. Yeah. at one point. They were 1-3 and three in the month of November. Then they got hot at the right time. So uh, we'll just kind of root for them and see how it goes, you know? Yeah, I think if the key guys stay healthy, my hunch is that it's going to be Green Bay and Tampa again in the NFC Championship. Your hunch is probably pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brad. So before we wrap up, Alan, any final questions for Brad? Yeah, uh, if we wanted to follow you on social media, where, where could we find you? Yeah, if, it, if it's TikTok, it's Big Bad Brad 14. If it's Instagram or Twitter, it's Brad underscore Johnson underscore 14. And uh, pretty simple. You reach out to me and, and, uh, I kind of just try to have fun with all social media, nothing too serious. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. And also just for the Glazier family, you guys need to induct Brad Johnson into the ring of honor. That's something that should have happened yesterday. So like literally Brad Johnson, one of the greatest quarterbacks in Tampa Bay history, man. I love you so much. I'm so happy that you came on. Thank you I, so I can't much. even begin yeah. to tell you how meaningful this was for me. Yeah. I mean, I appreciate you guys reaching out to me, being part of your show. Uh, you got a guy's got a great show and I'm sharing some pictures, sharing some stories. And uh, so hopefully everyone can enjoy. Absolutely, man. We'll be in touch with you soon. Thank you so much again. Good. Thank you, guys. See you now. Right, take, take care. Take care, man. Yo. Wow. That was awesome. <laughs> that was so awesome. Yeah. Well, all right, guys, if you want to follow us, follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast on Facebook and on Instagram and at Seize underscore podcast on Twitter. Like, subscribe, hit the, hit the bell. bell. And thank you so much for watching. See you next time.